Well, good morning, um, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Rena Moran, state representative from District 65A, um, right here in St. Paul. So um, this is like a, a really hard and heavy subject for many of us who really believe and continue to fight to allow kids to be, if, all, if at all possible, with their parents, with family support, and if not, with kinship as a second option. So today you're gonna to hear a little bit about um, the bill and, uh, and some stories to go along with that. All children in Minnesota, no matter their geographic location, their socioeconomic status, or cultural background, deserve to live in safe, loving homes that nurture positive development. Children depend on having a stable environment to call home and with the sense of, be of belonging. Community, and culture it brings plays an important role in their perspective of future success. Unfortunately, there are deep systemic disparities within Minnesota child protection system that are failing children and families alike in our African American communities. I both heard, I've both heard stories from our communities and have seen the data that shows that black families are being unfairly targeted, often with little recourse for the parents. We can't sit on the sideline and wait for improvements to come within the same system. So today, we are renewing our push for the Minnesota African American Family Preservation Act. We know that in Minnesota, a black child is three times more likely to be removed from their home than a white child. Once a child is ripped apart from their family, we know the consequences that awaits them. These can range from lack of school success or having poor health outcomes and becoming involved in the criminal justice system. This is unacceptable. And as a policymaker and as policymakers, we have to share responsibility to end inequities and injustices like this. Legislators are both Democrat, Democratic and Republican, should share the goal of keeping families together. Fundamentally, families belong together. The Minnesota African American Family Preser Preservation Act will end the unfair, arbitrary removal of African American children from their homes. It will increase the chances if a child is removed from home that they will be able to stay with another family member as opposed to a foster family who is a stranger to that child. The bill creates an African-American Child Welfare Oversight Council within the Minnesota Department of Human Services to monitor case plans and services to ensure the unique, the unique needs of all black children are being met. It also promotes strategies in areas such as employment, education, and housing to strengthen opportunities instead of separating families. Significantly, the bills require African-American cultural competency training for individuals working with child protection systems. I thank the families who have come forth to share their stories and explain for everyone here how the unjust systems currently in place have failed them in heartbreaking ways. Senator Hayden, who is my chief author um, in the Senate, um, is on his way. He is stuck uh, in traffic on 280 with an accident that has happened in front of him. But between Senator Hayden and the rest of the United Black Legislative Caucus, him and I and us are committed to enacting needed changes like those contained within our bill to ensure that our child protection system surely, truly, has the best interests of all Minnesotan children in mind. 
And with that, I would like to introduce Khalees Houston of Village Arms. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Moran. I want to just start by saying that if the cases that we were discussing here were cases of actual abuse against children, physical, sexual, or egregious harm, we would not be here. What we're here to argue is that African American children are being wrongfully removed from their homes in face of the same allegations as white as their white counterparts. So the African American Family Preservation Act would serve to do several things, but one of the primary would be to provide oversight to uh, workers working for and within the African American community. Hardly a day goes by without another example of racism in everyday American life. We've seen examples of driving while black, walking while black, and even living in your own home while black. Yet somehow there is an enormous blind spot when it comes to one of the worst examples of racial bias in American life, the risk of parenting while black, or parenting while Native American for that matter. There's a large group within child welfare, including many who call themselves liberals, who insist that they are so much better than the rest of humanity, that their field is magically immune from the racial bias that permeates every aspect of American life. Unfortunately, the data proves differently. At the end of 2017, in Hennepin County, 1,610 children were removed from home. 616 were African American, and 407 were two or more racist. In Ramsey County, 1,566 children were placed, 590 were African American, and 294 were two or more racist. And what's important to note is that over 50% of the children in the two or more racist category have at least one black parent. So the data is actually staggering, and uh, racial disproportionality in our system tells its own story. The history of race in our country adds up to bias. We value some people more than we value others, and we see some people's love for their children as more valid and valuable than others. Um, and to provide an example of that, I have Latanya Robiecki here from uh, Anoka County who's been fighting for um, virtually the entire um, lifespan of her, her three-year-old grandson for placement of him. And um, hearing her story will uh, just illustrate how stark differences are when it's a white uh, parent, foster parent, or guardian um, compared to black. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Latanya Rebecca. I'm a paternal grandmother who has been foster care licensed since 2017 by the county of Anoka, which is the county I live in. My grandson was taken by Chisago County CPS at birth in 2016 and placed in stranger Caucasian foster care. My grandson also has a half-sister who's Caucasian. She was removed by the county at the same time. She was immediately placed with her non-licensed Caucasian gr paternal grandmother. She never saw a day of stranger foster care and was placed with no hesitation. Here I am, almost three years later, still battling to bring my grandson home. I only get one type a week. And an additional day every other, every other week to spend with my grandson. I've been involved since he's been born. I am constantly having to petition the courts to get more time with him. I jumped through all the hoops placed in front of me by the county at their request. This whole process has broken my heart. I am, however, thankful for the support of the state ombudsman, Anoka County Licensing, and a, D a Minnesota DHS representative. I've missed out on a lot of first moments and memories that I have felt that is being stolen from me. I was still and am completely capable and devoted to raising my grandson. I felt the same way and voiced this two years, 11 months ago when this all started. The amount of damage emotionally, physically, and mentally over the last two years, 11 months is unspeakable. The strain this has caused me and my family is extremely painful. For my children to watch how the difference in standards have been applied by Chisago County is saddening. At a time when we should be evolving instead of feeling of being suppressed is overcoming me. I've raised my children to treat everyone equally. So for them to witness this firsthand is very disheartening. Not a day goes by that I don't wake with a weight on my heart. I wonder what my grandson had for breakfast, if he had a good day at school, if he needed me because he didn't feel good or had boo-boo-boo. 
I am his grandmother, the one that would give her last breath to, for him to take his next. I love my grandson and I'm pleading for a change, for accountability, for a chance to be treated equally. By being here today, I'm hoping that the state of Minnesota will encourage these counties to keep our African-American families together instead of tearing them apart. And this is what I believe is in the best interest of the child. Thank you. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for questions. Mm -hmm. Last question. You talked at one point. You talked about Republicans and Democrats uh, agree about keeping families together. And a lot of times, it's almost more a Republican issue that complains about the state coming in and taking children away and, and dividing families. So given that. Do you have any hope that you can get support uh, with the Republican majority in the Senate because it sort of acts on a belief that they've expressed generally? Um, so the hope is, yes, that uh, we are in conversation with Republicans um, in the Senate. I know Senator Jeff Hayden has uh, uh, is expected to have a hearing um, in Health and Human Service Policy in the Senate. Uh, I'm, no, I'm in conversation myself with Senator Rosen. Um, and, you know, we really believe when they see the data, when they hear the stories, and so often the narrative is the Republican complaining that government needs to get out of people's lives so that they can do what they need to do. In this instance, that is our narrative, that government has came into our homes in the very footprint of looking at our kids and has said that we're not worthy for them to be placed, not only with uh, a grandmother or aunt or a sister, but to put them in foster care with strangers. We know the importance of, the, and especially in the case of, of this grandmother here, the value and importance of the first three years of life. Those are years that, you know, she did not get a chance to see um, uh, her baby crawl for the first time or be able to hug him in a way that is important and that is supportive for him. And so our hope is that, you know, we are at a time uh, right now, um, definitely with more legislative color um, in the state legislature, but also we're smarter. We know the impact of ACES and what ACES has on adverse childhood experiences and what those look like. We are smarter because we also know what about trauma. We know about historical trauma. We know about toxic stress and what that does to a, a child and a family and a whole community. So it's our hope that, you know, that we are in this time right now that we can look at how we are keeping kids safe and whether or not we're really doing that in, in a really holistic, comprehensive way that is really in benefiting children. Any other questions? So um, I believe um, the uh, House File 342 um, will be having a hearing uh, on February the 26th uh, in Health and Human Service Policy Committee. Uh, where you will have an opportunity to not only hear from one grandmother and the heartbreaks of one grandmother, you know, but hear at length uh, a common theme that is showing up when it comes to African American families. Um, so, there have been some efforts to tackle this through the courts. Do you want to comment on that in any way, or are you speaking of the case with the grandmother that? I, you know, it came up last year. I can't remember the details, but I remember because this bill was introduced last year as well. Yes. yes. And and then there, the, but there was also an effort to try to address this in the courts because of the systemic racism, I believe, in the Department of Human Services in terms of placing children. I think that was the gist of it, but I can't quite recall. I don't know that the uh, courts has done um, undertaken any initiatives to address. Um, racial disproportionality or bias, but it's our hope that they will. Um, on February 21st, I'll be hosting in partnership with Mitchell Hamline in um, a conference to talk about just that, how the courts, the judges, public defenders, and county attorneys actually lend to disproportionality. It's not just on the part of um, child welfare agencies. We all play a role in it, all parties to the case. So we're hoping that um, that will start to uh, open up the door for more conversations and initiatives to address it. And Senator Hayden just walked in, so he may have some things to say. 
Well, thank you. I'm out of breath. There was a, not a lot of slipping on 280 this morning, so sorry that I'm late. Um, I'm sure these guys have covered all of this. This is my first time at the rodeo. Um, I will add a couple of things. I have gotten a commitment out of Senator Abler uh, to hear the bill. Um, we've heard a series of bills that we are going to. We've already heard um, a portion of what's in this bill around reunification once a family has had their parental rights uh, terminated. Senator Champion, along with Representative Moran, have a bill that got heard in the Senate that allows, right now the county attorney is the only one that can petition the courts for those uh, parental rights to be restored. To this point, the county attorney has never petitioned the courts for families' rights to be restored. Never. Zero. So we're now saying that we should think that children should, um, or their parents should be able to come back um, under a certain set of criteria that the judge would consider um, if they've gotten their lives in order uh, and restored. And I'll give you an anecdotal uh, uh, kind of talk about that. Let's say somebody's parental rights have been taken away from because of substance abuse disorder, what we used to call chemical health or addiction issues. Um, our folks uh, who come in and testify on behalf of this, especially in the opioid conversation, have said it takes about a year to 18 months usually for people to go through the kind of treatment and do the kind of work that they have to kind of get their lives back together and to move forward. However, the process to terminate a, per a person's parental rights only takes a year. Mm -hmm. So those, th those two things fly in the face. If it takes you a year to year and a half, to get your parental, I mean, to get your life back together, but they take away your, your child within a year, mm -hmm. then there's an, if you do do that, there's an opportunity of redemption to be able to get your child back so that they can kind of go back to their families, go back to their communities. Um, I think we've talked about this issue of uh, cultural genocide. I've had a lot of young African American and other people who said that when, once they went into foster care, they were totally removed from their communities, not just their parents, but their extended family, their culture, right, their teachers, their basketball teams, um, and they grew up in a process in which they didn't know who they were and subsequently had a lot of trouble dealing with society because they had no grounding. So those are just the kind of things um, in which we hope, and Senator Abler uh, has said that he'll hear it now if it gets in the bill and what it costs and all of that kind of stuff, I think that we'll have to take a look at. But at the end of the day, um, and I also talked to a community activist who said, wow, we're still doing this? He remembers in the late 1980s when uh, Representative Stanton came here, that's how the Council of African Heritage, uh, Heritage and their precursor, the Council of Black uh, Minnesotans, was really founded on this issue, mm -hmm. right? This is in the late 80s or whatever. So it's time. Now it's time. Um, sorry that I'm late. Hopefully I didn't step on too many people's uh, comments, but it's time. And we've been dealing with this issue. And I'll leave you with this, and I've been saying this a lot along the kind of renewed sense of coming together as a community. If it's good for black people, if it's good for people of color, it's good for the state. That's right. Thank you, Senator Hayden. Um, the narrative um, that we've been provided is that the increase in opioid use is the um, reason for the spike in removal, but I would ask the question, why aren't white children being removed at similar rates? Um, and aside from that, child protection law does not mandate that we remove a child based solely on a parent's use of an illegal substance. There has to be an adverse observable impact to that child because of the parent's substance use. We are seeing children removed based solely on a parent's positive uh, drug test without the assessment of risk being performed when the, the children are African American. So the reason for this bill is to, again, provide the oversight and accountability that we need, but uh, primarily legislative safeguards at every point of contact with child protection because disparities exist across the continuum for our families. Any other questions? So we just want to thank you again for coming out. And uh, our hope is that we will see both of these bills moving in the House and the Senate to come to some resolution about how we can keep kids safe, but also create strong and healthy children and families in this community and thus a stronger state. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need a copy of the report?